first sermon was extra short. My second one was extra long. I don't know what I don't know what today's going to be. <laughs> could be could be <laughs> could be twenty minutes. Could be two hours. <laughs> Some of you are nervous. <laughs> we haven't even started preaching. You're nervous. All right. Turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter number 13. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse number 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So I don't know how a Christian can say they only need the New Testament when the New Testament says that you need the Old Testament. <laughs> That's kind of weird, right? When, you say something, when people say things like that, they just show their ignorance of the Bible. <laughs> a good portion of the New Testament is a quote or a reference from the Old Testament. So I don't know how you can say you only need the New Testament. <laughs> so let's, let's see what we can learn um, from this passage. Before we start, why don't we just pray? Amen. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for an op opportunity to sing these great songs about you and what you've done for us. And Lord, as the uh, song we just sung um, went, Lord, help us, Lord, to examine our hearts and see if there's anything that we're holding back from the altar of sacrifice. And I um, pray to help us, uh, teach us from your word this morning. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Second, Second Kings chapter 13, starting verse number 1. The Bible says, In the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. Now let's take a little break. For those of you who don't know, uh, Jeroboam was the king of Israel. Uh, when David was king, uh, the whole kingdom of Israel was united. The northern tribe of Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, and the southern tribes of Judah, it was all one kingdom. It was all one kingdom under David. It was all one kingdom under his son Solomon. But then Rehoboam took the kingdom, and uh, he decided that the old guys didn't know what they were talking about, and he was going to listen to his friends, and he split the kingdom. And so you got ten tribes in the north called Israel, and two tribes in the south called Judah. And so when you're reading through your Old Testament and you see Israel and Judah, that's what it's talking about. Israel refers to those ten northern tribes, and Judah refers to those two southern tribes. Well, Jeroboam's the first king of the north. Jeroboam's the first king of Israel. And he decided, well, if I'm going to have my own kingdom, well, then I should have my own religion, too. And he said, you know what? Um, you're not going to... The Lord is not who brought you out of Egypt, Israel. It's, it's these golden idols. It's these golden calves. And it's too far for you to make the trip to Jerusalem. Why don't you just worship right here in Dan? Uh, we got a nice, nice contemporary service for you right here in Dan. Uh, you don't have to make the trip down to Jerusalem. You can just worship any way you please right here in Dan. Dan. And so that was the sins of Jeroboam. He forsook the Lord and gave him idols instead and said, well, you don't have to worship God like he tells you to do it. As long as you're sincere, as long as you really believe what you're doing, uh, that, that's fine. And so that was the sins of Jeroboam. And so Jehoaz here, he says he followed the sins of Jeroboam. That's what he did. He continued in this false worship of God. Verse number three. The Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. That's someone you don't want angry at you. <laughs> uh, someone who has the power to create the universe. Someone who has the power that holds your very life. That's not the one you want to make angry. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. And Jehoaz besought the Lord. So Je Jehoaz had his own idols. Jehoaz had his own gods. But it, when he was in real trouble, he knew he needed a real God. 
And you can say all religions are, are okay and all, all ways to God are okay. And you can say that when everything's going well, but when you get in real trouble, you're going to need someone who has the real power to answer. And so Jehoaz ditches the, go the golden calves, he ditches the idols, and he calls out to the Lord. The one he said that wasn't all that important. The one he said it didn't really matter. When he's in trouble, that's the one he goes to. And, uh, you know, you can say, you know, churches, I can take it or leave it. In the Bible, I can take it or leave it. But one day you're going to need the Lord. You're going to need him. The Bible says in verse number four, And Jehoaz besought the Lord. And the Lord hearkened unto him. Isn't, isn't God gracious? Isn't God merciful? That when someone who's forsaken him for so long and rejected him for so long, when they turn and he sees a desire to turn, he listens. The Bible says, And the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a Savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin, but walked therein. And there remained the grove also in Samaria. So, the Lord gives them a Savior, but they thought that the Savior was only sent to deliver them from the consequences of their sin. They didn't think the Savior was sent to deliver them from their sin. They thought the Savior was to get them out of the mess they were in, but they didn't think the Savior was to deliver them from what got them in the mess in the first place. They wanted to be delivered from the consequences and the harmful results of their sin, but they had no real desire to get rid of their sin. Now, that kind of thinking existed way back here in the Old Testament, uh, but thankfully um, nobody thinks like that anymore. Yeah. Verse number 7. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoaz, but fifty horsemen and ten chariots and ten thousand footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust by threshing. Uh, skip to verse number 10. In the thirty and seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash. So here's a, here's a different Joash, Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reign sixteen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. But he walked therein. All right, verse number 14. Now Elisha, Elisha is the, the prophet, the man of God that came after Elijah. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face. And said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoo. And he shot. You see how hard this King James Bible is to read? <laughs> you, think, you see how they, it needs to be updated because it's so hard and confusing? <laughs> and he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him, and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. Okay, Syria is a long time enemy of Israel. Syria has given, enemy, has given Israel trouble over many years and many generations. Um, the Bible says in verse 3 uh, that Syria oppressed them. And they knew they were being oppressed, not because somebody told them they were, but because they actually were. <laughs> If you don't know you're being impressed until, until you turn on the TV and somebody tells you that you're being oppressed, then chances are it's not that bad. But <laughs> Syria was oppressing Israel. Verse number 7, they destroyed them and made them like the dust by threshing. And Elisha said, 
hey, this bow and arrows, this is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance over Syria. Right here. It's right in your hands. And he said, he said, this is the answer. Hey, hey, Joash, this enemy that's oppressed you, this enemy that's destroyed you and wasted you and made, made you like the dust, oppressed you over so, so many years, here's the weapon right here. Here's what you need. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance from Syria. Right here, right here. Here it is. It's all yours, Joash. And Joash takes a few arrows out and he smites upon the ground. He says, well, it's, it's about all I need. It's about all the victory I need. That's, that's about all the triumph I need. And Elisha says, are you kidding me? Three arrows for Syria? Three arrows was all you needed against the enemy that so long oppressed you? Three arrows was all you needed against somebody that's destroyed you and wiped you out and caused you so much pain, saw you trouble? Are you kidding me? All those arrows that you had and you thought three was good enough? And the Bible says Elisha was wroth. He was angry. And you know what? When Israel was in trouble, you know what they did? They cried out to God. When Syria was oppressed, they cried out to God. But once they had some air to breathe, uh, once the Syria wasn't so close breathing down their necks, um, then they kind of lost their zeal to fight Syria. They kind of lost their uh, desire to fight the enemy. And you know what? That's how a lot of, that's how a lot of Christians are. Uh, the world and the flesh and the devil, they just, they just bind them and bind them and just make their life miserable. And you know what they do? They cry out to God. And what does God do? Well, He's merciful. He hearkens, right? And He delivers you. And then guess what? But as soon as, soon as you get a little space, as soon as we get a little time to breathe and the oppression's not so heavy, then guess what? It's... it's Back to, back to what we always did, right? And, uh, and guess what? You know what you have? If you have a King James Bible in your hand, you know what you have? You have the weapon of the Lord's deliverance. The, this, this right here, right here, it's the weapon of the Lord's deliverance over the world, the flesh, and the devil. The sin that's caused you so much pain, so much agony. Here it is. Here's the weapon right here. And people read a couple chapters and they put it down. And they come to church when nothing else is going on. And, and you know what? Now, I'm not a pastor, but I can guarantee this is one of the things that makes that just drives them up a wall. Is they see so much, how, how much blessings you could have, and how much deliverance you could have, and how much victory you could have. And they see people that are content just the way they are. Just the way they are. Well, I'm not going to hell anymore. Well, that's all you wanted. All the blessings that God has to offer, all the victory, all the rewards, all the crowns that you can get, and you're content to read two chapters a day, one chapter a day. I know everybody reads at a different rate, but you're content to just shoot three arrows when you could shoot five or six? And it made, the Lord, it made Elisha wroth. It made Elisha angry. You know what? You know why Syria survived? Syria, Syria wasn't too tough of an enemy. Uh, Syria survived because... The one that had the power to destroy them didn't have the ambition to do it. Amen. Didn't have the drive to do it. You know what? The world and the flesh and the devil, they're not too powerful an enemy for, an enemy for you. But they are if it's just one chapter a day and five minutes in prayer and come to church when you feel it, <clears throat> feel like it, then yeah, you're never going to get the victory over them. You know what? The victory is right here. This is the weapon of the Lord's deliverance. You need to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. And you don't, you don't stop. You don't stop. You keep going. Joash had the weapon in his hands that would destroy Syria completely. But he, had no, he, had, he didn't have the drive to do it. You know what we have? We have the very words of God. The creator of the universe gave us a book. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Everything you need to know is right here. But you've got to have the zeal to use it. You've got to have the ambition to make use of it. The weapon's right here. But you've got to use it. You've got to use it. You believe that Jesus Christ, do you believe the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses you from all sin? If I asked you to give me five verses on it, could you do it? You believe you have eternal security? You believe that no matter what happens, the Lord's going to hold you and not going to let you fall into hell? You believe that? 
Could you give me three references on it if I asked you? I'm not going to do it. I'm not your judge. But could you do it? How about a verse dealing with fear and anxiety? How about a verse about the proper order in the family, the proper role of the husband, the wife, the children? C could you do it? It's all right here. The answers are right here. You got to make use of it. You know, in our Bible-believing circles, uh, we downplay emotion because most people, most of this modern generation overemphasizes it. Everything's about emotion and how they feel. And, and you know, we, that's wrong. That's wrong. But you know what? We, we go the other way and we downplay it. You know, you're supposed to be in a relationship with the Lord. What kind of a relationship has no emotion behind it? Uh, there's, two, there's two emotions that you absolutely need to have victory in the Christian life. And it's, it's well, there's more than two. But there's a couple that you definitely need. And that's love and it's hatred. It's love for the Lord and it's a hatred for everything that will hurt your walk with the Lord. It's love for God and it's hatred for sin. And um, the more you realize and appreciate what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the more you'll love him. Uh, pastor kept saying, you know, I'm glad you're saved. Good, glad you're saved. You ought to never get over it. You ought to never get over what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Hung on that cross, let filthy sinners drive nails into his hands. Not because of everything, anything he'd ever done. Because you needed to be saved. And you needed to be saved. And I need to be saved. And you know what? The more you love, the more you realize and appreciate what the Lord's done for him, the more you'll love him. And the more you realize and appreciate what sin's done to you, the more you'll hate it. And the problem is um, not too much love or hatred. Look at, look at, look go, back, go back with me. It's in this chapter, 2 Kings chapter 13 here. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Um, you know what? The Lord saw Israel given adoration and praise to everything but the one that delivered them from Egypt, and it made them angry. Uh, the Lord saw uh, Israel uh, saying, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's too much of a trip to make the Jerusalem. I think I'll go worship here in Dan, and it made the Lord angry. And you know what? When the Lord looks down seeing Christians, and he, he shed his blood for them, he died for them, and they're excited about everything else but him. They're excited about everything else but Jesus Christ and the Word of God. They're, they're excited about about everything else but what should they should be excited about and it makes the Lord angry and and uh, he's not he loves you but he's angry with how you just take what he did for you like it's no big deal um, the Lord the Lord got angry the Lord got angry it makes him angry uh, when Christians are, are excited about ball games and new jobs and new clothes and new cars and new this and they're excited about this but no excitement for Jesus Christ no excitement for what the Lord's done and the Bible says it makes the Lord angry and he says I know what I'll do I'll deliver him into the hand of Syria uh, you know why you can't get victory over certain sins in your life because it don't make you angry it don't make you angry. Uh, you might dislike it. You might wish it wasn't so, but it doesn't stir you up. It doesn't make you angry. You want to get victory over sin? You got to get some anger. <laughs> you better stir it up. Uh, you know how to get. You know how to get angry. Don't tell me you don't know how to get angry. Oh yeah, you you, you pull out after church is over. Just pull out here. Wait till someone cuts you off. You you know how to get angry. You know how to get angry, right? Someone someone hurts your uh, someone hurts your wife, your husband, your children. You you know how to stir up anger. Don't tell me you can't get angry. You know how to get angry. You just got to take your ability to get anger and you got to point it and guide it in the right direction. Not somebody else's sin, but your own sin. Amen. You know how to get you know how to get angry. You got to get angry at what's hurting you. And um you know what, Joash had plenty of arrows in his quiver, but he only chose to shoot three of them. You know what 2 Kings 13 really teaches? Well, it teaches a lot of things, many of which I haven't found out yet, no doubt. <laughs> but you know what 2 Kings 13 teaches? 2 Kings 13 teaches that the victory that you and I don't have is simply because we haven't made use of it. We haven't taken the victory. The Bible says, Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. So why don't you have victory and why don't you have triumph? Amen. If the Lord's given it to you, why don't you have it? 
you have all the victory, all the answers right here. We both, we all do. But you got to make use of it. You got to get into it. The Bible, Jesus said, search the scriptures, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Isaiah says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Everything you see, everything you can smell, everything you touch is going to be gone one day, except what God said. Right here, right here, the word of our God shall stand forever. Spiritual apathy, spiritual apathy. It's a lack of desire to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know what? The preacher can only do so much. The preacher can only do so much. Look at verse number 15 again. Some people think they're just going to live in the world in the, the, you know, any way they want, Monday through Saturday, and they're supposed to come in for two hours on Sunday, and the preacher's supposed to fix it all. <laughs> Can't do that. There's how many hours in a week? What is it, 168? Yeah. Two or three hours a week is not going to combat 165 hours of living the way you want. You, you, got, you got to dig in, and you got to give it all you got. Look at verse number 15. It says, And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Okay, now you've now you got to open the window. <laughs> you can't shoot out the window. Open the window. And he opened it. And Elisha said, Shoot. <laughs> and he shot. And he, okay, okay this, is, this is the answer right here. You know what he's doing? He's walking him through it like a little baby. He says, okay, this is how you hold the bow. This is how you hold the arrow. Here, here, let me put my hand right on your hand. No, no, too high, too high, right here, right here. Okay, open the window, open the window. Okay, that way. Okay, ready, ready, shoot. Look at verse number 18. And he said, take the arrows, and he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. You know what he said? In verses 15, 16, 17, he walked him through and showed him exactly how to do it. Everything he needed in verse number 18 says, okay, now I've showed you how to do it. Now you do it. And you know what? The pastor can stand up here. He can say, okay, okay, here's some verses about trusting God. They're right here. Right here, turn to Psalm 62, trust it. Here's some verses about marriage. Here's, here's how you're supposed to act. And, and here's some, oh look, here's some verses about boldness. But at some point, you got to go do it for yourself. <laughs> you can only listen to, you can only learn so much by listening, by watching or listening to someone else show you how to do it. At some point, you got to go do it for yourself. You got to take that arrow and show it and shoot it for yourself. Preacher can only do so much. <laughs> Look, you know what? If you just got saved or you just got into a good church or whatever the case is, there's nothing wrong with somebody saying, okay, this is how you hold the arrow and this is how you hold the bow. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. But you've been saved five or six years and you still don't know where Jonah is and you still don't know what the difference between the old and this. Come on, you got to get with it. You got to take the instruction and you got to shoot it for yourself. You got to get with it. You know what? You'll never learn how to do it just by listening to someone else do it. You got to do it. How many sermons are you going to hear about prayer before you pray? How many sermons are you going to hear about witnessing before you open your mouth? You got, look, the preacher can only walk you through so long. If 10 years down the road, you're, you shoot, he's still got to say, okay, no, no, put your hand right here. Five years down the road, he's still got to say, no, open the window. Okay, shoot this way. There's nothing wrong if you just start now, but if five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, the preacher's going to still have to say, okay, okay, this is how you trust God. Turn to Psalm 60. Come on, guys <laughs> and girls. We got to get with it. We got to get with it. Uh, turn to Joshua chapter 7. I hope you're excited about your salvation. I hope you're excited about what the Lord did for you. But you know what? Salvation is the beginning. It's not the end. Amen. How many times are we out in the preach? How many, how many times are we out on the, uh, on the street and we, somebody walks by and say, I'm saved? Yeah, yeah that, okay, that's, that's the beginning. That, that's, all you, that's as far as you wanted to go. You got born again. So you're telling me you want to stay a baby your whole life? <laughs> you got born the first time. Didn't you want to grow up? 
Weren't you excited about getting your license? Weren't you excited about getting your first job and then getting married? Whatever the case, or not getting married, but weren't you excited about people get born again and they say, well, I just want to stay like this my whole life. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I'll read a few verses here. Verse number 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was, oh, here's the Lord's anger again, it was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither. For they are but few. You know what? You start getting a little bit of victory and you start getting overconfident. <laughs> the Bible says without the Lord we can do nothing. Nothing means nothing. <laughs> you need the Lord for everything. Verse number 4. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall envire us round, cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Joshua, why are you lying down? Get up, get up. Verse 11, Israel has sinned. Don't you know the problem, Joshua? It's sin. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more except ye destroy the accursed from among you. So you know what Joshua, you know what Joshua said in verse, uh, verse number 7? He said, would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. You know what he said? He said, we should have just, we should have just been satisfied with getting out of Egypt. We should never have tried to get into Canaan. We should have just been satisfied with what the Lord did for us in Egypt. We should have never tried to cross Jordan because all it's caused is trouble. All this, all, I mean, we here, I mean, we're, we, we, what do you mean? You, didn't you beat Jericho, didn't he? The Lord knocked down those walls and now you run into a little trouble and now you want to quit. Now you wish you never crossed Jordan. And uh, that's what a lot of Christians are like. They're, they should, they, they try to serve the Lord in just, just a little, little trouble. And by and by they are offended. And they said, oh, we should have just been satisfied with being saved. Oh, we should have never, should have never tried to serve the Lord. Should have never tried to stretch out, done anything for him. And the Bible says, uh, the, Lord, the Lord said, Joshua, what are you doing lying down? What are you having a pity party? Get up, get up. The problem's sin, Joshua. He says, you don't get rid of that sin. I'm not, I'm not going to be with you anymore. You're not taking, you're not conquering any more land. You're not taking any more cities. I'm not going to be with you. If you want to go out there, you're going to go out there by yourself because I'm not going with you. And uh, you know what, what a lot of people do? A lot of people want to go on for the Lord, but they don't want to get the sin out of their life. And the Lord says, you can't go on until you get that sin out of your life. And if you do go on, you'll be going on by yourself because I ain't going. Until you get that sin out of your life, then I'm not going with you. And Joshua said, oh, oh, it's the sin, is it? Now what, now what are you going to be, now when the Lord points his finger at your sin, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, you're going to pretend the sin's not there? You're going to pretend like it's not a big, big deal after all, or are you going to get rid of it? You know what, Joshua had the right attitude, as we'll see. Skip down to verse 22. I'm not going to, for sake of time, I won't read the whole chapter. But they, they figured out who it was. 
And the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And it may not be found out now, but it will be found out. Some men's sins are open beforehand going to judgment, and some they follow after. But nobody gets away with it. And uh, they figured out who it was. It was, it was Achan. It was Achan. Verse number 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto, unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters. Your sin doesn't just affect you, it affects a lot of other people too. And his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And, the, and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. You say, why'd they, have to, why'd they have to kill his kids too? Why'd they have to kill his family and all his stuff? That's, well, it's the same people that say, why do I have to shoot five or six arrows? Why can't I just shoot three arrows? Because you're content with just getting it out of, out of, keeping it at a distance, but you don't want to utterly destroy it. You know what? Can I talk to our crowd? Because that's, that's who's here today. I can't, can't really preach too well to the people that aren't here. So why don't I talk to our crowd? <laughs> We're pretty good. We got the right Bible. We got the right doctrine, right? And we're pretty good at keeping the Syrians at bay. We're pretty good at keeping the enemy at bay. We're pretty good at getting them out of what everyone can see, right? But we kind of lack on that zeal to totally destroy it. We're pretty good at shooting a few arrows, but we're not so good on keeping it coming and keeping it coming and day in and day out fighting and fighting. Paul says, endure therefore hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, this, the, you, you, you get tired of fighting and you're going to start losing the battle. You're going to start losing the victory. Uh, you got to fight. You got to fight. You got to fight. You got to fight. Uh, get two places in your Bible. <clears throat> get 2 Corinthians, both in 2 Corinthians, chapter 7 and chapter 10. Now, there was a sin in the church at Corinth, right? Paul said, uh, there's fornication among you, such as is common among the Gentiles. It's well reported. Everybody knows about it. See, he's not, he's not, he's not backbiting. He's not gossiping. He said, look, I, I've heard this from everybody knows this. Everybody knows this going on. And you know what? They allowed it to go on. They allowed it to not be rebuked or dealt with. And so 1 Corinthians is a harsh rebuke to the Corinthian church. But you know what? <laughs> Shockingly, they do. They actually take the rebuke. It's amazing. They actually take the reproof and they get it right. And Paul writes 2 Corinthians. He's trying to comfort them. And he's trying to say, hey, thanks for getting it right. Don't, don't get too down about this. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, look at verse number 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. <clears throat> for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, I can't go too far into this, but there's two kinds of sorrows. There's godly sorrow, and there's the sorrow of the world. They're sorry that I'm, I've sinned against the God that loved me and died for me and taken care of me all my life. And there's a sorry that, well, I'm just not really sorry about that. I'm just sorry I'm suffering all the consequences of my sin. And there's a couple, there's a couple kinds of sorrows there. Verse number 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that she sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Look at chapter 10, verse number 6. And having in a readiness to revenge 
all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. All right, so I got, I got some good news for you. It's been maybe a lot of negative so far. I got some good news for you, right? The Lord is giving you permission to take revenge. Amen. Praise the Lord, right? Now, isn't there a lot of people that you could think that you want to take vengeance on, get revenge on? Yeah, two of us, <laughs> right? I, I can think of some people I'd like to take revenge on, right? Get some vengeance on. You know what? The Lord said in Romans 12, you just, you just leave all that to me. I'll, I'll take vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. He says, I'll give you something you can take vengeance on, though. You want to you get some revenge? You want to get some vengeance? Take it out on your own disobedience. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians says they had a readiness to a readiness to revenge all disobedience. You know what? You know what? You know what? You know why you take revenge? You 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 know why you want revenge? You want revenge because someone's hurt you. You want revenge because someone's done you wrong. You know what the key to wanting vengeance and getting angry and getting stirred up is? You got to see what sin's done for, done to you, and done to your family, and done to your country, and done to the people you care about. You know what sin does? Sin sends people to hell. They burn forever. I don't enjoy saying that, but that's a fact of the Bible. Sin sends people to hell. Sin ruins marriages and relationships and friendships. Uh, sin destroys lives and testimonies. Sin robs you of your peace. Sin robs you of your joy. Sin robs you of a sound mind. It robs you of purpose to your life. Don't you want to take vengeance on something like that? Don't you want to get some, work up some indignation, some revenge, and some anger towards that? You know what? If that doesn't get you stirred up, I'm going to be honest with you. If that doesn't get you stirred up, there's nothing I can say that's going to help. Honestly, if that doesn't get you stirred up, then what, you're not going to, why would you listen to me? If that won't get you stirred up, there's nothing I can say that will. You know what? You got to you got to get along with your heart. You got to get along with God and say, God, what is wrong with my heart? I get angry at everything that doesn't matter in eternity and the things that actually do matter that I can't get stirred up about. I got to get fix my heart. There's so many people we could look at in this world and say they need vengeance and they need vengeance. And that's absolutely true and the Lord will take care of it. The Lord said, "What are you worried about that for? That's my job." I've given you something to take vengeance on. Now you take vengeance on what you can take vengeance on. You, can control, you can't control everybody else. You can control you. You can control your heart and your spirit and your attitude. And that's what you need to take vengeance on. Take revenge. You know what Isaiah 63 talks about the Lord's coming. He says, the day of vengeance is in my heart. You know what? For 2,000 years, this, the Lord has walked this, the Lord has watched this world mock Jesus Christ and mock Christians and make fun of the Bible and mock righteousness. And, re and you know what? One of these days the Lord's going to say, I've had enough of this I can take. He's going to come back and he's, he's got one thing on his heart and in mind, and that's vengeance. He said, the, the, the saints, and you read in Revelation, he said, the, they say, how long, O Lord, how long will they not judge and avenge our blood? Avenge our souls of everything that's happened. The Lord says, okay, I'm ready. Now's the time. I'm going to take vengeance. He says, the day of vengeance is in my heart. When the Lord comes back, he's coming back in indignation and wrath and fury. That's the, that's the kind of attitude you need to take on sin. That's the kind of attitude you need to have. You, and that's the kind of heart attitude you need to have toward your own sin. you got to have the day of vengeance in your heart over what's wrecked your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And over what's wrecked your friendships and your marriage and everything else that you can think of. It's sin. You know, the Bible says in John, John 16, it's a very convicting verse. See, I, I, I already got this message. I already preached it to myself. <laughs> I know what pastors mean when they say that. Man, they, they are, I already got it. I already preached it to myself. Jesus says in John, he says, your joy no man taketh from you. He said, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. And Jesus said, nobody could take that from you. So if you don't have joy, you, you can't blame anyone else. Jesus said, no one could take it from you. Your lack of joy is evidence of the Holy Spirit. Not, you're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no reason why we can't have joy. You say, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. My life's pretty good. It's easy for me to say. But the one that was going to the cross said that. Paul said, as sorrowful, yet all we rejoicing. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you find out what, we, what he went through. 
and he went. He was always rejoicing. He was locked in the inner prison. His hands, feet were made fast, stuck fast in the bonds. You know what he was doing? He was singing, "Just as I am without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me." He was singing hymns. He had joy in his heart. He had peace in his heart in the prison. Your joy, no man taketh from you. You know what? You got to get. You got to stirred up. The Bible says in Ephesians four, "Be ye angry and sin not." It's not supposed to drive you to sin, but it is supposed to drive you to have vengeance on your own disobedience. You know what Joshua said? "Would to God we had been content." Oh, would to God we had been content. You know what? You know that's true. You know what? If Joshua had never crossed Jordan, he never would have had any trouble with AI. Those thirty-six men would have been alive, right? Those 36 men would never have died. He, he, he got extra trouble for going into the land. He got extra trouble for, going, for crossing Jordan. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of trouble and sorrow that Joshua and Israel had just because they wanted to serve the Lord, just because they wanted to take the victory. But you know what? There was also a lot of great victories they would have missed out on. You know what? Those walls of Jericho never would have fallen down. That, that woman Rahab, that harlot, she got saved, she got delivered. She never would have been no mention of her. You know what? You can sit back and just say, I don't want to go on because there's trouble. And you know what? You'll, you'll miss out on some trouble, I'll be honest with you. You'll miss out on some trouble, some heartache. But you'll miss out on a lot of great victories too. You'll miss out on a lot of great comfort and a lot of great peace. There's peace that the Lord gives you going through trials that you can't get if you didn't go through them. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 7, he says, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Paul said, I am I'm comforted, I am excited, because I know, I know that with sufferings comes consolation. And since you've suffered, you're also going to get the consolation. And you know what? You, you suffer for the cause of Christ, for the Word of God, there's be, there are going to be some sufferings. But there will also be some great consolation. No sufferings, no consolation. You know who thinks the Christian life is boring? Somebody who just sits back and is content to get out of Egypt, but they don't want to cross into Jordan. Somebody who wants to just do the necessary things to get out of hell. And you know what? You know what a lot of people want. You know what most people want? They they don't want to be oppressed by the enemy. They, they, but they don't want the full victory either. They, they, they don't want to be, they don't want to be, here, here, here it is, here it is. You know what, I'll give it to you plain. You know what it is? They don't want to be a drunk on the street, right? They don't want to be a bum living under the bridge. But they think a little alcohol is okay, right? Uh, they, they, don't, they don't want to be, you know, totally overrun by sin, but they, they, they're really not all against it either. As long as it's not making their life uncomfortable, as long as, as, long as they can live the life they want to live, they're, they're okay with it. That's too, many, that's too many of our attitudes towards sin. You know what? Turn to, to, uh, let's turn to one more passage. Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. I'll tell you, the Christian life is a lot of things, uh, if, if done right. Uh, and just read, read the Apostle Paul. Read Acts and read 2 Corinthians, and you'll get a good dose of what the Christian life is. And you'll find out it's exciting, it's full of triumph, it's full of failure sometimes, but it's full of great joy, and it's full of great consolation. Now look at Proverbs chapter 24, look at verse number 15. Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You know what? There's two people falling here. The just man and the wicked man both fall. But you know what the difference is? One gets up and one just never, give, never gives it another shot. You know what? Not one of us can say we've never fallen. Oh, you could point to certain things you've never done. You could point to certain sins you've never done. And, but none of us can say, oh, I've always done those things that please my Father. You know what? We, could, we got two options. We could stay down, or you can get back up again. Just man falls seven times and riseth up again. You know what? It's not an excuse to fall. I hope nothing I say 
give you the impression that, I'm, that the Lord's okay with falling. But you know what? When you fall, you got to get up again. And you know what? Some people never fall because they never attempt anything. Uh, you're just playing it safe. Well, I've never, I've never, I never did that. Or never, yeah, but you never tried either, <laughs> right? I mean, there's some people that never fail because they never try. I, I give you one quote. It's not, it's not Bible, but I, I thought it was good. It's uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He said this. He said, "It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better." The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, now listen to this, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Amen. You know what? I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, here's the talent you gave me. It's safe because I hid it in the ground. I never lost it. I never lost it. And the Lord's going to say, yeah, but you never did nothing with it either. And you know what? I guarantee if you try to serve the Lord, you're going to, going to stumble a little bit. I guarantee you're not going to do it perfectly the first time or the second time or the third time. <laughs> I guarantee it's not going to all be flawless. But I, I, know it gets, I, best, I guess what? I guarantee the Lord's pleased with someone that's trying. And you know what? At least you tried. Right? At least give it a shot. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I can understand trying and failing because I've, I've done it plenty of times. But I, you know, I honestly, this is not preaching, this is just me. I honestly can't, I don't understand the desire not to try. Yeah. I, don't, I don't get it. I, don't, I can understand falling, but I don't, I don't understand not even trying. I don't, I don't understand not giving it a shot. In Genesis 33, where we won't review the whole history, but um, there's two, Isaac has two sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. And um, Esau wastes everything. And he misses out on the birthright. He misses out on the blessing of Isaac and Abraham. It's all gone. No inheritance of the land. All gone. Blessing all gone. Jacob meets some life later on. And he tries to send them presents. And Esau says, oh, my brother, I have enough. I have enough. I'm, I'm good. I'm all set. I have enough. Really, Esau, you have enough? No birthright. No blessing. No, no covenant. No inheritance. But you, you have enough. And you know what? That's a lot of Christians today. They got no rewards coming at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, they got nobody in heaven that's going to be glad. Hey, thanks for leading me to the Lord. Uh, they got no relationship to the Lord, but they have enough. They're comfortable. Uh, their, their bills are paid. Their, their health's okay. They have enough. You know what? Don't, don't be like Esau. You know, what? You, you, know what you, take, you know what you take vengeance on? You take vengeance on things that you really care about. The reason we don't take vengeance on sins because our relationship to the Lord is it's not all that important. It's not. You know what? When Esau found out everything that he could have had and it went up in smoke and it was gone, Jacob deceived him. The Bible says he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry. When he realized the full extent of everything he lost, <laughs> he couldn't handle it. You know what I'm afraid? I'm afraid too many Christians are going to get up to the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to see all the things they could have had, all the rewards, all the crown of rejoicing, all the people they could have won to the Lord, and they're going to see everybody else enjoying it. They're going to have, and then you know what? It's going to be a great and exceeding bitter cry. The Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I hope you're saved. If you're saved, I hope you're excited about it. Amen. But that's, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of the road. That's not the end. Philippians says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun, begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, what, you know what's going to be so great about heaven? We won't have sin. We'll be just like Christ. Just like him. No sin to deal with. No dirty thoughts. No evil heart. We'll be 
It'll all be gone. Well, if that's what's going to make heaven so great, don't you think you'd want to be getting as close as you can on earth <laughs> before you get there? Amen. You want to have the greatest life you could possibly have on earth? you got to get as close to Jesus Christ on earth, just like you'll be in heaven. You know what we all need to pray, every one of us? We need to pray, Thy will, O Lord, be done on earth in my little piece of ground as it is in heaven. You have a desire to hold on to your sin, or you have a desire to go on for the Lord. Don't take my word for it. Take Esau's word for it. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. it. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for what great treasure and truth is in it. Lord, for each one of us, myself included, may, may we take to heart the things that you've shown us in your precious Bible. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Never get over the fact that Jesus died to save you. Always remember how good it is to be saved. Well, I, I like that. You know, uh, again, boy, I don't want to preach that again. That was good. Quit too early. <laughs> One of the, uh, the, really the value of that Old Testament. There's the example. You realize that uh, Joe Ash, if he had been reading in his scriptures there and been listening to the to the tales of Joshua. Joshua came along one time and he holds out a spear towards Ai. Next chapter there, he holds that spear out. He didn't let that spear down until the city was captured, until it was all over. Moses goes out there and he sends him out. He sits on a rock. He's standing there with his hands up. They said, as long as they're going to get victory, as long as his hands are up. When he gets tired, he gets help. Other people help him. Everybody get tired. I'm tired. Thanks for the help. <laughs> Amen. Makes victory that sweet to know that it wasn't alone. You get to share the victory with others. Let's stand. Maybe the Lord dealt with your heart about something. Maybe it's something that you really need to, to come to the Lord about. And. Uh,